Hello and welcome to another episode of Search Off The Record, a podcast coming to you from the Google search team discussing all things search and having some fun along the way. My name is Gary and I'm joined today by John Muller from the search relations team of which I'm also part of. Hi, I'm John. I love cheese. Yeah, you do. For a while now, we've been thinking about bringing in more guests whose work inspires us. The list is very long, so it's highly unlikely that we'll be able to cover everyone, I guess. But I thought most will agree that we should absolutely start with Aleda Solis. Hi, Aleda. Hello, Gary. Hello, John. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for having me. It's super nice to have you. We've known each other for a very long time, and it's always exciting to chat with you about random things but especially about internet and search things. Yes, indeed. I'm very looking forward for our conversation today. Are you nervous about our conversation? A a little bit, I have to say. Yes, indeed. I I do a lot of podcasts, webinars, etc. But yes, in this case, it's it's, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a different experience for me. And of course, you and John always make me nervous. Don't ask me why, right? Oh, but I'm only trying a little to make people nervous. Oh, well. I don't know, Gary. I don't know. Maybe it's a bright light that uh, she has in her face. That could be. Yes, uh, it's very bright in uh, your studio. And I am i don't know how I feel about it. So I just project this darkness uh, from my corner of the world. That sounds very Sauron-like, Gary. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> that's very nice of you to say. So as I said, uh, we've known each other for a very long time. And when I first encountered you on the internet, you were already relatively well known. This was like, I don't know, like two centuries ago, even. So uh, I was uh, very curious about your background and how you came to be the Aleda Solis that everyone knows today. So this whole podcast is I was thinking to focus it around you and how you became the person you are today, the internet persona that you are today. And how can others become basically the new Aleda, for example, or a new Aleda. And without further ado, let's uh, start with a few questions. Cool. Okay. So I have a question. When did you first encounter a computer? So I remember, and it's likely, I believe, at least the first time that I remember to have interacted or have seen a computer. In fact, it was a laptop. It was my dad when I was around potentially eight years old or nine years old, and he was he brought a laptop from work and it was a huge laptop uh, but for me it was a mind blowing machine right and he he had a blue screen and he was working in it and i had no idea what he was doing in it but i was like yeah i, I very impressed i actually asked my neighbor over just to take a look at it uh, because we were like typical friends right and uh, shockingly or not because this we need to remember it was in Nicaragua in the 80s he came over and because he was literally in my dad's room at the time like watching him typing in the laptop he left the, his bike a little bit too in the outdoor of my home and it got stolen so yes it's a it's a not necessarily a nice story but it's probably the reason of why i remember it indeed was it one of those really old computers where you had only two colors on the screen yes yes I remember playing very, very old games on those monitors, and it was still exciting. Those games back then were very uh, entertaining in a very different way than today. 100%. I have to say that later afterwards, potentially years after, right? But, you know, like in children time that you, you never know. But I remember then my dad taking me to his work and then me getting bored. So he pretty much put me in an empty computer, not laptop at the time, and me playing Prince of Persia already. So that that was a little bit more advanced and I enjoyed so much and found it super, yes, I could spend there like for hours and me not wanting to go back home because I wanted to keep playing Prince of Persia indeed. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very exciting game. Um, And then I remember a little later, maybe a a few years later after Prince of Persia was big, we started seeing more of the internet around. When was the first time you encountered the internet? Because for me, it was relatively soon after my first encounter with Prince of Persia. Interesting. Yeah, so in in my case, uh, 
may, maybe it's because I, well, I didn't have a, a computer at home yet at that point, but it was from my neighbors. I actually watch a lot of series with, and we were very engaged with uh, the X-Files at, at that point. So I remember them getting an internet connection and then they telling me, oh, you know that in the internet, we can try to look more about the X-Files and what, what happens in the series and what is true. <laughs> because we, we thought that it was like so, sort of a documentary, I guess, uh, at that point, rather than fiction, right? Uh, so we, we actually made use of Alta Vista. Uh, I remember it to look for X-Files re related information at that point in it. Wait, so Alta Vista was your favorite search engine? Well, not favorite. It was what it was available, I guess, at the time. And of course, it was the one that was pretty fine in their computer, right? And of course, I had zero idea and zero knowledge pretty much at that point on how to look for more, install more. And it was not even my computer, right? I, would, I wouldn't have dared to, to do anything on, on it. It's interesting that you mentioned Alta Vista because uh, that was also the first search engine that I used. Oh, interesting. I... I remember like my early days of the internet, I would go to Yahoo, like not, not Alta wow. Vista, but on, on Yahoo, they had this page with new websites and you could spend like an hour or two and look at all the new websites that came out. And thinking back now, it's like, well, it's like, let me look at all the new websites that happened since last week is like, you, you have no chance so much stuff happening all the time but back then it was there were like 10 new websites that came out and you can look at them. amazing I, I actually still remember though also when i realized that there was something better than alta vista and uh, i remember that it was metacrawler or something like that and it was um, someone mentioned me uh, okay yeah alta vista is nice but have you seen this other uh search engine that yeah it's much better better results etc and 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 i went at Took a look at it and much cleaner too than Alta Vista, Meta Crawler. But but then after, I think it was a few years after, it was of course Google that was literally game changing. I, I believe that I was already in the university first year or so, second year um, or so. Yes, and, and finding Google and that was actually mind blowing indeed. I, I don't actually remember like when I ran into Google. It's it's so weird. Like thinking back now, it's like you should have remembered like when you first encountered Google kind of thing where he's like, oh, everything was better. But it it to to me, like in, in my mind, it just kind of like subtly happened over time. It was not, never like, oh, this is like so much better than everything else before. For me, it's actually very memorable because uh, I was extremely against Google in 98, 99, because it was way too simple. It was way too different from the other search engines. Basically, like if you think of Alta Vista, um, for example, they had very weird adverts sort of things on, on the search result page that were very often very annoying. And I thought that that's how the internet should be. That's like, even if you went to Yahoo, for example, uh, to the directory, you saw these banners and whatnot that were super annoying. But for me, it was that was the internet. And then you went to, to Google and it was this very simple interface with just four blue links and some snippets and whatever. And that was very strange to me, very alien to go back to the X-File reference. So so how did you make your first website? When when did you decide like you need to be on the internet now? So this is interesting and and uh let's say a little bit of a serendipity type of thing. And I was uh, already in my first year of university, so that was in 1999 and um they were given this free HTML course to all the, the, those students in the in the first year. Um uh, and then somehow at this time that they were given this course, I had another class. So I was one of those few people who had this other extra class and I couldn't attend and I felt bad and I felt actually a little bit mad, right? And I was like, no, I cannot get behind, you know? So I literally went and looked for 
the person who was teaching it and asked for the manual, HTML, right? And, um, and, and then I, teacher, by the way, was a second year student. <laughs> so pretty much I was like, oh, really want to learn this, whatever. And he was like, oh, can you at this time, like come around, it's very simple, whatever. I will, you know, try to give you tips of the, what I'm telling the others, whatever. And I went and pretty much it was a blog notes and uh, learning HTML tags. And it was all, all very logical for me at, at that point. And I, I did it. And then this is a funny thing, right? The first website that I did was a website about um, marine turtles. Uh, they, they are quite a big thing in Nicaragua. And there, there's a lot of efforts protecting them because people kill them and people eat their eggs, which is crazy. Yeah. When they say, okay, let you need as a final project for the course, you need to do a website about something. And I literally had no idea about what to do. So I decided, oh, about marine turtles and why we need to protect them, uh, resources, whatever about them, facts about them. And I ended up doing my first website about marine turtles. And very likely, not because of the quality of my code or how beautiful the website was, it ended up winning the the first prize because there was a competition uh but very likely because of the topic right uh that a lot of people yeah really liked and um and yes yeah, so I, I i i don't even remember what they gave it to me so i i just remember that i won and because i won i actually got thanks to that my first job proposal ever um because uh, it was nicaragua remember this was like a yeah small country um the it was like a family of another student who saw my website about marine turtles. And he was the owner of a small ISP provider in Nicaragua. And they had a web design department and they were needing new people. And he thought my website was good enough for to try to hire me for their web design department. So I started to work part time in my second year of university uh, as a web designer there because of that. So yeah, it was like all very serendipity and that is how I started. It started it all pretty much, yeah. So so basically your first website was number one ranking from the start. It's like you never started anywhere else, like number one ranking. And thanks always. for the content, not even the quality of the code. So yeah, that says <laughs> a lot, it is, content quality. It's also interesting because uh, it feels like you are one of the few SEOs I know who actually has formal training in like publishing on the internet. Like most of the most of the SEOs I know, they are self-taught from the very beginning. Like they self-teach their HTML skills and whatnot. But you actually learned that in university. Yes, I, they taught it to me. I'm unfortunately not a self-learner. So, so smart to do that, I'm afraid. I needed to be taught. <laughs> <laughs> to start. So then uh, you were working in an office at that point? Yes, I was shockingly working in an office for quite a while. In fact, well, all my work life until uh, at an agency and then uh, also in-house. And then it was until 2012 that I got, 2012, I got uh, my first job offer as an in-house SEO. And that, and I, actually one of the things that really took my attention at the time is like, oh, and you're going to ba be based in Madrid, but you are going to be able to work remotely from home because all the team members were spread across Europe, right? And for me, that was, it, it, it was, it was uh, exciting, but also at the same time, I was scared. I was very scary because, you know, I was very used to the office at that point and having a boss that, so they could see that I was working and doing my work with it. Then I realized that all what I believed and this cultural factor that or, or context, which I had been developed myself so far, was broken, right? And I could very well work from anywhere I, I wanted, I liked, and I and and I I started and never went back, even when I changed jobs, etc. I became independent. My one criteria was like, I want to continue to be able to work remotely. Yeah. So did when you became independent, did you have an office for yourself or did you also work kind, kind of from home and remotely? The, you, you know what? I, at some point, I also went to a co-working um, place, but it was pretty much to socialize and interact with other people. Uh, those days when I needed a little bit more yeah, socialization, but actually when I actually wanted to make things happen and do in-depth work and audit analysis etc i needed to stay at home because I, I needed to be in a quiet space yeah i find 
it very humorous that you were working in an office because you are one of the biggest proponents for remote working. And uh, you also have this uh, site, remoters.net, where you can um, search for uh, remote jobs. It's actually a beautiful site. If you don't know the site, you should check it out, even just for the the looks of the site, if nothing else. So yeah, I, I find it very humorous that you were working in a <laughs> in an office in some really weird way. <laughs> yeah, I cannot even imagine myself right now about that, but I work in very big offices. So for example, in Nicaragua, before coming to Spain to study here, I used to be a web designer slash front-end uh, web developer, uh, the biggest newspaper uh, there. So it was like a huge office full of uh, journalists, etc. And yes, I was in a very small room with the other web team, etc. But yes, it was like surrounded by people like that. And I have to say that sometimes I miss that interaction and being able to be surrounded by people, especially now with <laughs> our situation, right? But uh, I have to say, right, that it also allowed me to understand when I started to work remotely, it blew my mind that how gate changing that was for me already at that point, uh, even like I was based in Madrid, but that opened up the opportunity for me to start working for many brands from all over the world. Uh, from the US, from all over Europe, from the UK, Germany, et cetera. And, and then it also made me realize how game changing it could have been for me 10 years before, right? Uh, and maybe I wouldn't have needed to leave Nicaragua to develop myself professionally if I had had that opportunity. So I we started Remoters with Elisa uh, Martinez, who's an SEO here from Spain, by the way, a friend of mine uh, in 2015 because of that, because uh, a lot of people were asking us about, oh, how do you work remotely for even for Spanish people at that point was mind blowing already. And uh, so I realized, OK, we need, really need to make this happen to allow other people to do it in case they want or in case they need. Um, I as, as someone from a uh, uh, development country myself, I understand that there are people who are very skilled, very knowledgeable, who unfortunately are not able to have access to uh, jobs that they could otherwise very easily have access to if they w had were born in, in another country, right? So um, with remoters, that is one of my goals, right? To facilitate the access uh, from people all over the world uh, to to, to this type of jobs. And SEO uh, in particular, I believe that is one of those areas that where is that very, and, and web development too, and copywriters. So there are certain areas that can, you, you know, you don't need formal training, for example, they, they, they don't, shouldn't ask you for a certificate or something like that. So anybody and anywhere in the world with the right type of, of um, knowledge and, and experience should be able to have access to amazing jobs and have a fulfilling career independently of their location. I imagine that uh, being remote also allows the person to develop themselves into a more visible person on Twitter or social or the internet in general. Do you think that uh, being remote help you in any sense to become so visible? Because like, I, I, I can't think of a single SEO who doesn't know your name or who you are. You are insanely visible. I, I, I do think I do think so, Gary, because actually that one of the reasons why I went so much to conferences before and events, etc., it, it was to fulfill that socialization need that I didn't have because I will have been otherwise stuck at home working all the time, right? So, and since I had flexibility to working while traveling, uh, which can be tricky, by the way, you need a lot of self-discipline, but once that you master it, it, it is amazing. It can be an amazing mix. Um, I, I decided to go all in, right? And that definitely allowed me the opportunity to start meeting people from all over the world and network with people. Uh, sometimes it was people that I first met online over Twitter, for example, that is a platform that I use a lot. But in other cases, it was the other way around, right? It's people that I initially had met at a conference somewhere, and then I started following and saw that they had a, an amazing community around them, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I, I do believe that this has a, a big, let's say, uh, it's one of the big reasons uh, for it, for sure. What, what kind of things would you recommend for other people who are looking to becoming a, a little bit more active in the area of SEO? Amazing. So that that is a really good question, John. And literally, I, I don't know, I receive like dozens of emails every month asking me about this. And that is why I decided to create 
learningseo.io. That is a free website uh, featuring a roadmap of the different areas of SEOs uh, where you can go and if you're starting in SEO or just want to, let, let's, let's say, like advance or see the options for you to continue developing yourself as an SEO, go and take a look at the different areas and then resources that are reliable, that are free also to access and tools that are free and start using them to uh, focus your knowledge much more or decide to, um, let's say, expand your knowledge in other areas too. Um, this is the thing, right? I, 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 when I started in SEO, there wasn't many resources at that time. It was difficult, right? I remember going to SEO modes, webmaster words, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's a little bit the other way around. There's so much content and it's difficult to know where to start. It's also difficult to know what is reliable and what is not and where you should focus, right? Like, and, and there's the beauty of SEO. Like if you want to focus only on content, you can. If you're more technical and want to be a technical SEO, you can. If you like the promotional marketing side of things, you can become a lean builder. Why not? And if you want to do it all and you want to be a strategist, you can. The, the, the industry is already mature enough to in order to do that. There's a wealth of, of information. Hopefully with that resource, I help at least partially to solve that that need of new people trying to get access to information. In many cases also, we need a, a, we, we see a lot of courses, et cetera, that are paid. They also have a non-trivial price for many people, especially those that don't live in, in, uh, in Europe or the US, for example, more developed countries. And so at the end of the day, hopefully with this resource, also it will allow to people that have less of an income and resources at the start to to empower their careers to to start establishing themselves uh, that type of knowledge that is needed to to decide whether they want to be an SEO and how to focus their career what area is the best for them etc so do you, do you think it's critical for people to have their own website when they start like if you're thinking about SEO should you be practicing everything on your own website before you become professional? Or is, is there a path kind of like, I don't know, if, if you want to be a doctor, it's not that you go off and like practice on people randomly. It's like, first you have your education and then you do your work. H how do you see that happening with regards to SEO? I will highly recommend if uh, it is doable. And I believe that now uh, there are so many different platforms that provide that option for free to go ahead and, and uh, create your own website, right? To test things around, to validate what you read, what you learn, uh, to check what is actually true in your context and, and to also identify how hard things are realistically, because in theory, many things sound like very easy sometimes and, and in practice it's not. So uh, yes, I will highly, highly, highly recommend um, for anybody learning SEO to go and even if, for example, they don't want to be a technical SEO necessarily, you can go and even start a WordPress website that is completely free. They don't need to go in necessarily into the code. It's, that is something that is not attractive for them at that point, et cetera, just to focus on the content optimization type of things. So there, there are so many ways that you can do this and leverage. And the point here is to validate, to test for yourself, to build for yourself in order to be have a better understanding. And there's no better way to learn than doing, right? Indeed. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it's it's always one of those things where you run across people who are interested in SEO, but they don't really know where to start. And at least pushing them off and like telling them like, oh, just like try it out. Uh, I think that's that's always a little bit encouraging. In, also, in the sense of, well, you can't break anything if you're just playing around with your own website. Like in the worst case, you start over and you pick a new domain name if you really messed up. Uh, but uh, it's essentially, it's it's like really low cost and low effort to to try things out. And then you you can kind of like go through the resources that you have and and try different things out. And yeah, I don't, I don't know, like look at things like internal linking and how to put content together and then read the documentation, read the blog posts, the guides that are out there, watch some of the videos. 100% how to structure your own site, etc. Hopefully, you know, they do something as bad that you need to change your domain name in case you, the domain name is the one of at your name, <laughs> then you will need to change your own name. No, 
I'm kidding. <laughs> but yes, I hear you. I, I completely, I completely agree. I, I feel, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but at least the the older school SEOs, they've all gone through the phase of setting up weird sites that in the end, you're like, maybe I shouldn't leave this online. I I don't know. I, I used to have these people that join my office hours from time to time as well, where I can tell they're they're doing sneaky stuff and they're trying things out. But you can also tell that they're they're getting started in this world of SEO. And from from my point of view, it's like if you're trying weird things out for yourself, you're learning something. And uh, all of the sneaky stuff that you learn from, I don't know, doing weird things with regards to SEO, all of that kind of maps to parts of SEO, to technical SEO. And once you settle down and work at a, I don't know, a real company in quotes, you you can still use all of those techniques. It's you understand which parts are sneaky and which parts are problematic, but the techniques are are essentially the same. And you can go in there and say, well, I have practice with this. I've seen how hard it is to rank for competitive queries, uh, but you, you kind of at least have a bit more understanding. I think that's super useful. 100%. I completely agree. In fact, I, I have to say that, especially if you're starting, right, and, and applying for jobs as a junior type of, 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 of specialist, uh, showing that you have been proactive and have tested for yourself, you know, even if you're just starting learning, that can definitely give you like a like an additional point for, for the position that you're applying for sure. And then, of course, trying everything out, right? Like What it is important here is the, let's say, the ethics uh, side of things, right? If you test many things that are maybe against Google guidelines, but if, if it is in your website, just to verify how harmful it can be and you assume the consequences, then no problem at all. The problem is that when you apply this sort of techniques in websites of your clients are paying you for this uh, to help them and you do something that we that will end up being harmful at the end of the day. So that that is what is actually bad about it. So as long as we are aware of all of, all of this and and um, behave accordingly, then no problem at all, for sure. Yeah, you definitely have to know the the kind of the line where where you have to avoid crossing. My my feeling is if you're doing these kind of sneaky things, you know what what is sneaky and what is not. And then you should know to avoid doing that kind of stuff for legitimate companies because they can't just go off and change their name just because like you messed up something on the website completely. What I really like nowadays, at least, uh, is that um, you can ask really, even really basic questions um, on certain uh, sites. Like I see on Reddit, for example, sometimes there are really basic questions and people jump in and without being sarcastic, they answer. Uh, so it's not me who's answering but someone else. On Twitter, for example, I see that, uh, um, like, for example, John or you, sometimes you are answering very basic questions. Um, and uh, that's, I, I feel that's very nice that people should feel um, free to ask even what they would consider like a air quote, uh, dumb question. Um, because, well, everyone has to start somewhere, right? Um, and um, if you are worried that you might do something stupid and uh, get your side banned or a client side banned, better just go and ask, um, especially if it's a simple thing that uh, basically people don't have to invest lots of time in actually answering. 100%. I completely agree. And that is why it's important that also that um, I think that more than before right now there's this awareness at least uh, about how important it is to be a little bit of more inclusive with this type of questions also with newcomers that no dumb questions right and and um unfortunately seo twitter sometimes can be uh, harsh and difficult and uh, might be trolls etc so even myself sometimes is um double think about saying something because of how it can be understood or the reaction so i can definitely understand how scary it might be even if you're just starting right that is why i'm also very happy to see um all of this uh type of of uh, efforts that are made so for example arish where the woman in tech is your group providing a safe let's say a safe space for for women to to ask uh, around also more mentorship programs for um 
um, people who are not so well represented in, in the industry too. So these are amazing efforts, but 100%, I agree that the way to actually solve like the root <laughs> of it all is that we should all be free and able to ask whatever with we might be thinking without necessarily like, yeah, this sort of, of, of backlash, right? And of course, if you ever ask or need to know anything regarding SEO, please just tweet away, tag me, and I'll be more than happy to refer you to the resource or answer you right away if it is something easy, doable to do at that point. Cool. So Twitter is the best place for people to find you, or is there somewhere else where people could go if, if they wanted to, I don't know, hire you to do something bigger? Yeah, uh, well, I have my website, aleidasolis.com, where they have forms uh, to get in touch with me, et cetera, if it is something more professional related. And then, of course, in, in Twitter, I am very active, but I'm always sharing resources, news. I also have a newsletter that is called SEO FOMO, in case you want to keep updated and what's happening in, in the SEO uh, industry updates from Google to Although there are always updates, so yes, lots of news, <laughs> and and yes, I'm, I'm I think that a good place to get in touch with me right away will be Twitter, indeed at Aleda. I am there. So cool. Well, thank you for joining us here, Aleda. It's it's good to have you, and I I think this was a really good start in having some more guests from outside of Google as well. No, oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was such a fine conversation. Indeed, it was really exciting. Always exciting to chat with you, Aleda. Thank you, thank you very much for the chance to be able to to have a, a fun time with you here. It's a nice change from my usual day to day for sure. We've been having fun with these podcast episodes. I hope you, the listener, have found them both entertaining and insightful too. Feel free to drop us a note on Twitter or chat with us at one of our next virtual events we go to if you have any thoughts. And of course... Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.